G'day fans, and we're back talking about Star Trek Discovery. It's Dags and MPS talking about the episode People of Earth. They're not people of Earth attention, as you heard in Earth versus the Flying Saucers. People of Earth attention. Very exciting stuff. The third episode. Oh, lots of stuff's going down. MPS, what'd you think of it, old son? Oh, look, I think there was a lot of stuff that happened. I think there was some interesting stuff, and I think there was some it's it feels like uh, monster of the week almost you know we've sort of lost the the pattern of of overall and yeah we'll get more into the details shortly indeed we will i personally like the idea of the summary overview of the year for michael burnham you know she's doing this and she was doing that and meeting this and like and like doing all the marketplaces and all the rest but i actually thought that was quite good a lot of people are very critical of it yeah whatever one of the big questions though that i had to ask is the federation dude from the first episode, the uh, Sahil, I think, what happened to him? He was supposed to be like on the journey and following the round. He was going to be like the big cheese of the next um, of, of the series, and he just vanished. What happened to him? Well, look, it's it's funny you say that because I thought that okay, like The Walking Dead, which the first episode was just Michael, the second episode was just Discovery. Now they've combined the two, but I've got to say, this whole year—it's only been a year—isn't really that interesting like she's lost her, herself from the federation she separated herself like she's let them go and everything in a year like like we mentioned last time if this was a lot longer period five or ten years two or three even i'd say yeah that wouldn't make far more sense but it's too short a period you know it's it's just it's like you leave a a fan club for instance and a year later you're not turning around and go oh, i'm a whole different person no you're still the same person really you just you know, you're just not doing this thing. Then you see the people again and you go, hang on a second, I'm completely different. But you're not really. So that I just thought that was a little bit strange, a bit silly. Oh, I think you, you got to allow for the fact from her point of view, she didn't know when the discovery was going to reappear and has obviously caused a bit of traumatic stress and all the rest of it. And, you know, you never knew what was going to happen. And she, like, she didn't know if they were going to turn up next week or like 100 years from now or whatever. So you can cut the slack a little bit. What was funny, though, from the crew's perspective, they're going, oh, my God, we finally found Michael. But from their point of view, she's only been gone for a day, right? Yeah. Because, you know, they had the second episode where they had the thing in the bar and whatever, and um, whenever that was. And, and it's all been good now. So, uh, yeah, from her, yeah, so they're all going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. But actually, in reality, yeah, she's been hardly missing. It, it, it's been so. a few days for Discovery, and all of a sudden, they're, they're you know Tilly's thing with her and Michael in the in the corridor where she goes, oh, everyone's dead. It's been like centuries. I was like, yeah, but really, that shouldn't kick in yet. It's just it's been only a few days. I'm just not sure about this timeline thing. Yeah, that's a good point uh, about the fact from Tilly's point of view, it's just been a very short period of time. But I did actually like the idea that they've brought that up. Because I think mm. we mentioned last time around, what happens if your crew members are all gung ho, going, "Yes, let's get into the future. It'll be fantastic." And then they get there and they realize, "Shit, everybody they knew, you know, everyone has died. Like all their families, all their relatives, everything they know is just gone." And the realization of that. Now you're right. Maybe with the Tilly thing, it could have happened a few episodes later. But I did like the fact they did bring it up because prior to that, no one really thought about the repercussions of jumping a thousand years into the mm. future and and how that would impact uh, your your lifestyle. And of course, all the people you left behind. To them, that you just sort of died and just vanished. There was like maybe no memorial service or anything. So I, I did actually like that bit. I thought it actually was good that they brought that up. Now, you brought up the whole thing of the dilithium. They sort of covered that off a bit more. And uh, when the burn happened, it all went kablooey all at the same time. All these starships just went so, you know, just completely thermonuclear. That would have been a, made a massive mess of the entire galaxy. Uh, and I thought it was interesting that it all happened at the same time. And it sort of did occur to me that effectively the Discovery universe is now becoming a bit like Mad Max. Where in Mad Max, oil and petrol is like the golden ticket. You know, you got to get that. And of course, in the Discovery, now it's dilithium. You know, yeah, whoever's got dilithium, they're the ones that everybody's sort of targeting. And uh, I thought that was actually quite interesting because a lot of fans have been arguing about whether in that thousand years or that 800 years, how come uh, alternative methods of propulsion hadn't really been explored? Why is it that it was just dilithium only? It's like even in our world, we're looking at, you know, renewable energy and all the rest of it. So there's a little bit of criticism about the fact I just said, oh, we'll stick with dilithium and nothing else. So 800 years after Discovery left, conceivably they should have been using something else. But, you know, that's for the Trek nerds to mull over. What can I say, eh? For all intents and purposes, a shitload of Star Trek uh, starships went bluey. And you can imagine the Enterprise, Enterprise, probably the M or the N or the O or the P <laughs> or the Q, 
that went as well. What was interesting is I, I thought I heard two different versions. I thought I heard, you see the vision of the ships just all sitting in space and then they blow up. And then someone says they were all at warp. When they were all at warp, they exploded, which means that some ships, if they weren't at warp at a particular time, would have survived. So there's a bit of a, a confusion there, I think. So, Well, considering like dilithium's used to, you know, like regulate antimatter sort of regular reactions and stuff, I guess if it's going to go kablooey, your warp core is going to have a massive breach and it's not going to end well, what can I say? So I guess that's probably something that's a little bit uh, uh, questionable in a lot of ways. Um, which also brings up the question... If you get it from a planet, then the planet should have exploded as well. Oh, good point. They mined it on Remus. I know that much. Good old lithium does come from Remus and other places. And you're right. Those planets must have gone kaboom. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Oh, yeah, well done. I like that one. Um, some fans, because you know what fans are like, they sort of mull over this stuff. They said, hang on. But how come if the starships blow up? Yeah, fair enough. But subspace communication should still continue on because the relays... You know, they'd still be there. You know, you know, like it should be able to still communicate across the quadrants and all the rest of it. Although some nerds have said, yeah, but if a substation relay happens to use dilithium to power itself, then it would have gone uh, kablooey. So there's a bit of an unquestionable, um, sort of like bit of gap there as to saying, well, what's the deal with that? But anyway, let's take it all at face value. The world is not a good place at the moment, but we've got to see the earth. We're back on earth. How good is that? <laughs> so, uh, what do you think of that? Well, if I saw what I saw, then they showed Australia on the on the bottom of yes, the planet. Yes, they did when they first they arrived. Were, good old yeah, yeah, Skippy Land was in there. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and it was funny because mentioning the fact that there's no subspace communication when they go when Saru goes, oh, put her on screen, and she goes, oh, on screen visor. That's quaint, you know. It's like, well, how would you communicate then? Yeah, you know, is it all yeah. holograms and stuff, or what do you? But I got to say, when they they found out that Earth wasn't the Earth that they remember and all that sort of stuff, and they trans the the what are they called now? The United Earth Defense Force. When they transported on that ship, there was some serious transporting. They were everywhere in one shot, basically. You know, there was none of this, oh, Captain, we've got a transporter. You know, it's just, oh, we'll come down. And, oh, you're all here. Join the party. <laughs> Tell you what, it's not bad. I, I like the fact that you show the Earth at the end, and it's like, it's fantastic. You know, there's a beautiful weather, and they've got big-ass boats flying or sailing down, like, the harbour of San Francisco and the bridge is still there. So you'd be thinking, so what's the problem, mate? It all looks grouse and fantastic. You know, Earth is self-sufficient like it is today. So it's almost like you expect the whole place to be sort of busted up and broken. But no, 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 it's all good. No dramas at all. So I thought that was actually really quite interesting. But seeing a gigantic boat in the in the harbour, I thought, yeah, okay, San Francisco Bay, fair enough. Seriously, a boat in, in the 31st <laughs> century? Like, please, people. The, yeah. I don't know if you noticed this, but I did. The... Golden Gate Bridge, which is a mecha design and all that sort of stuff, doesn't have cars or vehicles flying it because you know you can fly anywhere in space or you know three dimensional yeah. space, yeah. but it's all got solar panels across it. Oh, very good, mate. And so you've got all this renewable energy. So you know, it, I just thought that was pretty nifty to have that sort of thing. Um, maybe because they ran out of lithium, but you know, they've got to get a source of power from somewhere. Now, you mentioned about the Earth Earth Defence Force. Just as soon as I heard the name, the Earth Defence Force, I thought straight away of Babylon 5. That sounds like a kind of name you get out of Babylon 5, so they could have thought of something better than that. Their uniforms, very dodgy. It's like, what is it when everybody wearing blue all the time? It's like, yeah. get some better outfits. So who the costume designer on that, I don't think did much work at all. But they did mention the thing about the United Earth, and that's actually a very, very little subtle bit of continuity linking right back to previous Star Trek series. Uh, where the uh, the Earth was called United Earth before it became the United Federation of Planets. I thought it was quite a groovy and enterprise in particular, sort of like a reference that uh, quite a lot, which was uh, kind of cool. So, um, but uh, yeah, Earth Defense Forces, like, yeah, okay, no worries. But, um, and of course, you got these dudes stuck out on Titan, right? You got these dudes have been left out there. Now, of course, some fans have realized oh, when the Discovery first arrived in the solar system, they parked their asses right outside of Saturn. And of course, Titan is the moon of Saturn. So the guys on Titan wouldn't be going, hey, what's the deal with that? Federation Starship just appeared out of nowhere with dilithium. So, um, yeah, and you got the dude wearing the helmet. And you go, what are you wearing a helmet for, dude? Just take it off and be a human. What's the deal with that? And then, then they turn around and, yeah, Nadoya, when she turns around and says, have you seen the when? I would have gone, the who? Not the who, the when. <laughs> <laughs> what? Not the when, the who. Not the when, the who. what, the who, the... It's like who's on first. Who's on first? Yes. I mean, the guy's name. Who? The guy playing first. Who? The guy playing first base. Who? That could have been just hysterical to be done yeah. in that sort of fashion. It was it's just a, a little typical, bit... It's uh, a typical trope for a lot of shows where you've got... Um, 
two warring factions and it takes the cool puppies who have just arrived on time to fix it all up. You know, it was like, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll put you both in the same room, get this dude's helmet off, good old Wen, that was his name, get his helmet off, show that he's a dude. Oh, we're on tight, we've been having a hard day at the office, you know, and and uh, Nadoye goes, oh, yeah, okay, I didn't realise that. And it's just like, well, freaking hell, it's like, why couldn't you have organised this stuff like ages ago? So uh, I thought that was quite funny and it's almost like, a typical story where it takes the outsider to come in and fix the day because, you know, clearly these dudes aren't talking to each other. So that was uh, probably a little bit, that was probably a bit of the weaker side of the whole story. So, which, yeah. which kind of is a, is an interesting point because if you think about it, the Federation would come and ask questions first and, mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff and talk about the situation and try and work out diplomatic um, possibilities. But the, the United Earth Defense Force just go in shooting by the sounds yeah. of it. So it's, Shoot first, ask questions later. Whereas the Federation is, let's go and ask questions, get our sh- our tail shot at them. We'll fix the problem later on. You know, so it's it's almost like they've reverted back to how we are nowadays. Shoot first, yeah. ask questions later. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly right. And it's like it, it, a diplomatic incident could have easily been sorted out if the dude had just turned out without his helmet, right, from day one. <laughs> And said, hey, we're stuck on Titan. Can you help us? I was like, yeah, that it was probably one of the weaker elements of the entire story. Yeah. Um, a couple of interesting things that copped up. Uh, fans, you know, fans are like, you know, they're like digging into all sorts of stuff. Um, Booker's cat, Grudge, as you mentioned the other day, you know, you know he's holding the grudge, right? Because he keeps <laughs> referencing the grudge as a queen. There are some fans yeah. who think there's more to the cat than what meets the eye. So keep your eyes open for that one, uh, fans, if you're uh, interested. Oh, I'm, start, in I'm starting to feel cat. a bit of a, a Captain Marvel goose sort of thing happening here. You know, it's it's a it's not a cat from Earth, so even though it's an Earth bred cat, but who knows? Well, that's a very good point, actually. And if you remember your original series episode with Gary Seven, he had a cat, and that wasn't a normal cat either, if I recall if my trick lore is like happening with my head. Um <laughs> it very interesting. I I could I had to have a laugh when I heard about this. Michael mentions about the fact that in her year away, she's kind gone to uh Terralisium or whatever it is, no one's heard of her mother. And you know what that means? We're on an alternative timeline. Oh yeah. <laughs> what timeline could we be on? Oh, that Kelvin is like rearing its ugly head once again. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Um, I, I I found it interesting that in that she was a courier, which kind of made sense. But the thing that bugged me the most was her hair was too long for being only a year. You know, it was way too long. I know. But look, unless they're talking an, a year that is not a normal year, like we have 365 days, and unless they're talking about longer period because of and of all that sort of stuff. But uh, as, And then Tilly makes a mention of it, which I think is an ad-lib line. I think that line, because yeah. she laughs a different way in that, in that scene. So I think that line was ad-lib. I could be wrong, but that's how I see it. Well, I did like that in the one year gap, they showed Michael, excuse me, with different hairstyles. And it's like, okay, just to show that there's been a passage of time, she's gone, okay, I'll tie the perm and I'll try the braids and I'll try this and I'll try that. And it's like, yeah, that was, yeah, most people don't change their hair that much in a single year, but, you know, it is what it is and we'll just deal with it, shall we? Um, um, Good old Stamets, right? He uh, has a bit of a Google on about the spore drive. Now I have a real issue with the spore drive. I've always had an issue with it. You know, it's the ultimate fixer of stories. How can we get from the beta quadrant to Earth really, really quickly? I don't know. We'll just whiz up the spore drive and bang, there we are. And it's like, you'd think that every man and his dog would be saying, we don't want the dilithium crystals. We want the spore drive, just like they happened. And I think it was in season one. And uh, it's like, it should be history repeating itself. And of course, he just spills his beans out to uh, Adira. And um, yeah, and it's just like, oh, well, by the way, we've got a spore drive. How good's this? And yeah. like, right, isn't that meant to be a secret? But yeah. You know. Yeah, I know. Let's let's tell who we don't know anything. Yeah. Sell someone we don't know anything about. We've got a spore drive and we can jump from spot to spot to spot. 800 years in the future. Um, yeah. Two key things, right? So the Federation is not based on Earth. Oh, my God, they've done the bolt. They've nicked off. So where are they? You know, And there's, like, discussions as to whether they're on Trill. We'll get to Trill in a sec. Whether they're even on Romulus. Then when you hear the word... Now, this actually brings into that term uh, Vidaish, uh, Vidraish, which sounds, now that you think about it, Klingon and or Romulan, right? So maybe the Federation is now, uh, now on one of those two places. Of course, Romulus got blown up, so it'll be on new Romulus. And um, so it'll have to be interesting to see what the deal is with that. So Federation doesn't involve Earth anymore. How about that? That one came out of nowhere. What do you reckon? Well, that, that's that's interesting because if you've got the, the Earth sort of helped create the Federation, if I recall correctly. Yep, that's right. Yeah, were, exactly right. Yep. The Vulcans and 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 then people joined and the Federation became bigger. So there was galaxy-wide peace. But the minute you it's like any sort of 
club, once one person leaves, the club may not diminish because you'll get someone else in there. So maybe the Federation, the Earth just went, you know what? We don't, we're not following you guys anymore. And maybe the Federation's become a smaller group. Mm. Who knows? Uh, I, I'm interested to see where that sort of goes with with um, the Federation and how big it actually is and who's in it still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we know it's certainly shrunk because the flag, um, the stars on the flag had changed. Mm. So, but uh, yeah, I thought that was an interesting sort of twist. You know, we turn up for Starfleet, they're all gone and Federation's gone. So uh, yeah, watch this space. And I guess the biggest thing of all was the fact that Idira uh, is a trill, right? And it's, it's a harken right back to DS9, which is absolutely fantastic. So, and of course the first thing that struck nerds, Trek nerds everywhere is like, hang on, she ain't a trill. How can she have a symbiote, a symbiote, right? She's a human. And uh, now, if you remember your DS9 uh, law, humans can handle trills just for a short period of time, and they can't like really cope with it. But maybe in the 32nd century, they've got you know got the uh, the equivalent of the drugs and the what do you call it the needles and all sort of stuff and there's some treatments and a human being can actually handle a trill even though she's way too young only 16 they're supposed to be in their mid-20s at the very least but that would explain why she's not uh able to recall admiral tal's uh memories uh very very well meg because she is human so there's clearly a whole story there as to what the deal is with that and there are some nerds out there some trick nerds going oh my god it could be the dax symbiont how good would that be then it was like and the others are going nah you can't do that so uh Definitely watch this space. But uh, there's a theory that at some point uh, the show will go back to Trill the Planet and maybe the Dax Symbiont will be there uh, doing its thing. So, But, uh, yeah, that one sort of just came out of absolute left field, which was uh, kind of yeah. interesting. That was good because that was one of the things I didn't sort of see coming in the show. Um, yeah. Around and all of a sudden she's 16. But then all of a sudden she's, she's interested in this and she knows this and she knows that. And it's like, hang on, you know about Discovery. So that's what led mm. me to the, th- the thought that maybe there was a file somewhere that someone has found or a myth or whatever the case is, because no one walks onto a ship. No one, no one goes to a car and goes, well, hang on. Uh, this is a brand new concept car. This must run this and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And it just doesn't happen. Exactly right. Um, a couple of extra things that sort of popped up that fans have picked up on. The fact that Detmer doesn't seem to be too bad now after a slight PTSD uh, moment in the last episode. Having said that, she did sort of argue a little bit with Saru, so maybe there's a little bit more to it, but they've clearly um, um, sort of bypassed that. Giorgio has promoted herself to Admiral, just said, oh, I'm going to stick on an Admiral's <laughs> rank and away we go. <laughs> well, when you got a, she, well um, Michael made... Book a lieutenant, which he could have been an ensign for crying out loud. Yeah. You know, didn't have to go to lieutenant, but it was probably like closest uniform. Chuck it on, you're a lieutenant now. And I think Giorgio went, well, you know what? I'm gonna have some fun with this. If I can be anyone, I'll be an admiral. Yeah. So, but yeah. who has an admiral outfit just lying around? That's the question. Exactly right. Yeah, and it's like he's one we prepared early. Exactly right. Uh, and I like the idea that the ship is carrying shitloads of dilithium. Why? Is anybody's guess? So uh, it's like they got the whole like cases of this stuff floating around. I thought, yeah, starships only had what they needed just to fly around because you know when the dilithium crystals were losing their load, um, it was always a big deal in the shows. Imagine just saying, "I oh, will just go into the storage bin and just pull out another one." How good is that? So well, it's a bit of twisting of the rules. And uh, the other thing, uh, finally, um, when the crew finally get back to to Earth, they all go to Starfleet Command by default. Now, if it was nine hundred years in the future, okay, for yourself. Would you go somewhere else besides there? You'd be going, oh, I want to go back to my old stomping ground. I want to see where my gravestone is, you know, rather than just all congregate underneath underneath his big ass tree, which I don't know if it appears in other um, TV series or not, you know, uh, but I'd be curious to see if it did. But uh, yeah, they're all hanging around this one tree. You go, yeah, surely you want to go and check out the old hometown just to see if it's still there. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Well, he Suru gave him shore leave and it was like, hang on a second. I need you back on the ship. It was like, oh, how long did you actually get? You yeah. know, if you've got personal transporters, you could go wherever you wanted to and check every, you could have stood at the tree and gone, yes, nice tree. It's a little wider than, you know, but as things get older, they get wider. Um, oh, and yeah. then gone and done exactly that. Oh, I'll go check out this bookstore I loved. I'll go check out my own yeah. old family home or yeah. whatever the case is. Yeah. But I just thought it was a bit much to him. And then Tilly was being nice, saying, look, can we just have five more minutes? It's like, yeah, seriously, you're, you're in the 20th, 31st century what urgency is there yeah you have yeah. nothing to do really you're just yeah. plodding along so i thought that was a bit much he, they could have all had like a couple of days off yeah um to wander and I like around. They all, it's all the main cast together it's like well where are the other 70 something other people where are they are they all just like just didn't bother to join the main group so but uh, i thought it was a, an interesting sort of moment and i agree with you i mean considering when they left starfleet command that is like it's all forgotten history it's like going back to your old high school high school and you go you know sort of past all that move on but you know, it was a good moment. What can I say? 
All right, so all that's left now is to actually score the episode in Starfleet logo. So, uh, MPS, what is your score for People of Earth? I'm going to say I'm going to be a bit harsh and, and only two and a half stars. You know, it really was not that brilliant in my opinion. So what can I say? It's just you can do better discovery. Simple as that. Oh, that is harsh, mate. Oh, jeepers, creepers. <laughs> I'm the complete opposite. I actually quite enjoyed it. I actually really enjoyed the whole first half and the whole, you know, the whole year covering off thing and whatever else. I, I, it really worked for me. I actually gave it, believe it or not, four stars. Four oh, oh. How good is that? Now, admittedly, <laughs> the whole story between when and the doye, it was a little bit, yeah, yeah, take it or leave it. But overall, I actually found it quite engrossing and I did actually enjoy it. So, uh, uh, that's uh, my sort of my take on it. And uh, there's something else you want to add in there, MPS. Is that correct? I've got to say, I think it becomes a T-shirt logo right now, and that is cake is eternal. I tell you what, they are words to live by. And with that in mind, we're going to buzz off, and we'll be back in a few more days with episode four. How exciting is that? So in the interim, make sure you keep on trekking on. Okay, bye.